Okay, uh, my name is Tabat Zolzi. Uh, I'm a writer who's based in Cape Town and who started basically started taking writing seriously in 2014. And uh, today, in a way, I'm kind of talking about my roller coaster ride of like discovering the kind of work I want to write about and the kind of ways I want to write about and the kind of positive and negative relationships that I've established in these last three years uh, is developing right. So this discussion is rooted around the issue of the art writer in post apartheid in South Africa. The discourse, the discourse of higher learning in the acquisition of qualifications that enable black men and women in post apartheid in South Africa to practice is no longer rooted around race, rather it is rooted around cultural and social background. Understanding the contemporary irony or ambiguity of being in a political context or paradigm that is no longer anchor, anchored by racial division. In the, art community, in the art community, this division is still prevalent and contingent on historic, social, and class-based standards to evaluate competence and, professional, and professionalism. Now, <clears throat> the reason for creating my own strategies for writing about interior design in the future and creating a blog that is review oriented that also promotes my own writing, is that it justifies the historic relevance of the black writer in the art industry. That there is a market, but there are perceptions and perspectives that relegate the writer through historical and social lenses based on social background, class, and not the merits of producing the work. Now, uh, the discussion is not arguing that black writers do not have voices, Rather, these voices in the context of South Africa are occupying the historic location of being in the proverbial secretary's desk or waiting for the door to be opened. This discussion is stating that in order to start and maintain longevity, the historic location that the writer is occupying purports and maintains that he or she must open the door with white owned institutions and create his or her own strategy to practice and have a historic voice. Now the re reason I use the word for poet is that pro the professionalism of the black writer can be questioned based on class, class and background, therefore arouse all perception. And when the writer is, he is invited, he becomes relegated to the position of the disadvantage, therefore intellectually inept and not good enough to be compensated. The, the paradigm of volunteering I was subject to, I was subject to perpetuates the context in which the writer's practice is not just about handouts, it is also about the exclusion that is justified by standards of the work without uh, uh, the, the, that judgment being having any foundations. Inclusion is symbolic, but without compensation, this, symbol, this symbolism justifies the, decif, the, the divisive class paradigm that maintains the, the traditional writer patron relationship. It is an attitude that proposes that the black writers are not merely worthy of being published, but they also have to justify why they are writers. And this is not just about standards of work, but it's also about the standard of the institution, the historic location that it occupies, and its ethics of transformation. The discussion is not stating that the writer occupies a superior position in the context where writing about art is relevant. Rather, it seeks to highlight the symbolic position the artist and the writer occupy. The writer actually has a duty to highlight the superiority of the artist both in terms of the symbolic economic implication between writers and institutions and the economic implications for transformation in the, in the industry. Volunteering subsumes the attitude of Anne House while being in the, in the positions to morally judge with historical, historical connotations. It also pronounces the binary logic of class boundaries where one opposition of the binary, of the binary does not have to justify his career choice not the quality of his or her work. This position also pronounces the precarious position of being written out of, his, out of history by the particular institution. Now, in relation to issues of funding, my practice is still on the, perif the periphery, informed and placated by the symbolism of volunteering and long periods of inactivity and no communication. For example, the editors of the online publication Athrop, who give me the runaround about the quality of my work, which results in frustrating 
discussions of transformation and economic equality. This was also my experience with the Inganyeso publication based uh, in the UK, ZN, which is a publication that deals with the post-colonial discourse, which is the, like what I write about next to writing about art and, uh, and exhibitions. I sent a proposal to the editor and he never responded. This was in 2014 where I sent him an article and I never responded. This is also the case when I communicate with institutions overseas and with publishing companies here in South Africa like Jakana Media and Straight Publishers. My, my positive experience with the, the publisher overseas is that first they wanted proof that, uh, that I'm the person who wrote this work and upon, uh, and then upon receiving uh, the, the, the proposal and the proof, they were actually entertain my work and, and end up publishing my work. Now, one of the main reasons for participating in this discussion is that it is able to bring to the fore the question of transformation in the practice, not just as a symbolic matter. It also implicates how the quality of the work is received, in that the professional writer in the context like South Africa has to be conscious of the change social paradigm. Therefore, expectations of professionalism from the, from the institutions are expected. This way, transformation is not just about the symbolic implications of BE, it also makes the patron conscious of how practitioners perceive his or her institution. The implications for archiving are related to the strategies that freelancers employ. A blog can be a great vehicle, but it does not carry the same historic and economic weight as an institution or magazine. Therefore, the black writer's work is still relegated to, to the periphery without making incision in the annals of history. In the context of post apartheid South Africa, it is incumbent on the practitioner to make sure his or her work is recognized as historic but be, by producing independently. Practice lines are still blurred by historically held divisive values. And this is also incumbent on the practi practitioner to break down. It, it is not just related to the historic implications of archiving, it is also related to how transformation is not just symbolic but also but also informs art practice, oh, sorry, sorry. It's not just related to the historic implications of archiving. It, it is also related to how transformation is not just symbolic, but also has implications for practice. Archiving also has implications for the diversity that informs art practice in South Africa, where strategies for art as knowledge production become relegated, relegated to lack of professionalism and perceptions perceptions of historically held perception. The discourse of, of acknowledgement and distinctions through its methodology can demonstrate the historic complacency that both patrons and pra practitioners are subject to in pro practice South Africa. The discourse is a manner of reading that highlights how values of indi individual progression in both uh, communities with high income and low income are the same. When the practitioner, practitioner approaches an institution this can be characterized as an acknowledgement. And in South Africa, this has historical implication. It becomes a matter of distinction in the process of communicating with the institution where professionalism and personal feelings as historically held formative attitudes interfere with the professionalism and the new ethics of transformation that supposedly anchor the new, the, the supposedly new disp dispensation. with his or her historic connotations of servitude and the patron in his or her elevated economically determined position become locked in this moment of transcendental or historic realization regarding standards of work, professional conduct and the socially organic implications for breaking down historically held attitudes. attitudes. My work seeks to demonstrate that since practitioners can be perceived as servile, this is due to the fact that conceptions of writers in South Africa have not transcended the political and racial. That the notion of cerebrinity, which is a concept that is, uh, is anchored by the discourse of acknowledgement and distinctions, can de demonstrate how the practitioner is subject to a post-apartheid version of the idolizer, which is the social commentator. Cerebrinity is a notion devised by the discourse of acknowledgement and distinctions that highlights the intellectual illumination 
that transpires in moments of transcendental or historical realization. It is similar to a subliminal experience where the subliminal subsumes intuition, introduction, and displacements of signs of communication. Cerebrality espouses emotional and intellectual clarity. It is an expanding of the boundary and limits of a sign that eschews the sign's quintessence with the intention of establishing new strategies for organizing science. Cerebrality then can lead to the realization that happened upon with my interaction with the various institutions here in South Africa. Treated without historic relevance to, due to such short background, it also shows how through cerebrality or intellectual illumination, the comment, social commentator has had to transcend the, the limitations of class-based, personal oriented energy of the homogeneous narratives of a divided 20th century experience. An example would be the writer Ned Nakasa, who perished in exile without ever having published a major work in his native country. The point is how in my blog I approach writing about art. I have sued the, the, the figure of the social comedy with its occasions for emotional and personal engagement and adopted the illuminating and cerebrinous strategy of approaching the writing from an in-depth and academic perspective. The tone of my blog, I hope, is far from academic, but the mode of analysis, I hope, is imbued with the objectivity of an academic writer. This is the serenity moment for me as a writer in post apartheid South Africa and for, the patron or and for the patron or institution. It is still the moment of realization that racial and divisive attitudes are still prevalent, and it's not because the writer's work is in in inept or conduct is unprofessional. This is the reason I write about white artists as well as black artists. In the process, I've discovered the line where social consciousness meets for both the galleries and the respective artists. For example, with my interaction with Kaya Sinaile's work, through his overt township-based narrative, I was able to discern the manner in which the effect of his aesthetic operates beyond the limitations of the so-called township art. In artist uh, Michael Linder's exhibition, titled Exile, which was hosted by the Smith Gallery, I was able to discern the social consciousness aspect that becomes blurred in the fog of the historically held debate between high art and low art, how high art, looks, how high art lacks social consciousness and how low art lacks aesthetic value. In Sinéine's work, with this, with this unfinished effect and experimentations in representing the body's relationship with this environment, and its implications for, for par parochialism is able to transcend the township up paradigm by, be, by producing works that have effective implications in, on, in order to highlight its discourse. And historic implications. In Michael Linder's, with, with, in Linder's, with his works that rely on printing techniques to highlight the impact of advertising in the period immediate to the fall of apartheid on the white community. I was able to perceive the universal discourse in that with advertising, the, fer the frailty of the psyche, the, ex the exhibition discourse is an arena that the advertising industry seeks to conquer beyond the racial divide. These are artists whose exhibitions highlighted for me the measure with which the discourse of high art and low, or, and low art is broken down by the moral anchor that renders art universal and transcendental. Uh, that's that's why. Well. Th thank you, Temba. I'm not sure whether I'm a discussant or also I'm a moderator, so I'm going to play the two. And I feel yeah, I'm in a very awkward position to do justice. But there's so much things you've raised, and I pick up a few which I would like us to. Elaborate on one is the question of black writer. What it means to be a black writer in a context where there are already established uh, devices, expectation. You know, you call it uh, a historical position that black writers are not looked at, or their work they are not read in terms of the quality of their writing. They are not read in terms of the merit. But there's this historical positioning of being poor, 
of being coming from the margin, so much that the work becomes secondary to looking to, 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 to the discourse of writing. I want you to correct me if I'm reading you wrong there, because what I'm hearing you are saying is the black writer, whatever he writes or she writes, there's already a pre kind of set of expectation. One, you use the word historical positioning. And also you talk about the word a particular background, which I want to read the notion of biography, that this applies to, 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 to most black artists work. And for those who went to the art fair, for example, we saw Mama Esther on Thursday, we went to Mama Helen's discussion that it was not so much about her ideas in the world, it was so much about where she comes from, what it is that informs her work, the mother, the dreaming. While we're listening to Penny, Siopis as well as Sue Williamson, who were talking about the world of art making in terms of ideas. So in other words, the black writer is always predetermined from the outside, as Fanon would say, right? That's one point I want us to just flag there. The second point you, you talk about is also the question of, um, you use the word post-colonial, and then later you talk about post-apartheid. And in the previous discussion, to bring what I was going to ask, it seems we speak of apartheid as a moment that has no prehistory. In that, pro, in that process, we have a tendency to write out the colonial aspect of what have extended apartheid. Because remember, apartheid is an extension of a colonial project that, firstly, by Dutch, secondly, by British. So every time we speak about this whole moment of post-apartheid, post we write out, whether consciously or not, these other 300 and so years and it becomes now just 50 years, whereas apartheid built itself in this so-called history, long history of colonialism. And we know even the so-called post-apartheid moment is the construction, let's take for example the constitution. It's, there's nothing new about that constitution except amendments, right? An alteration of certain clauses and forms in which you talk about one, the notion of inclusion or exclusion. So what you get in the new constitution are certain kind of aspects that were taken from the Freedom Charter as a form of opening up. And yet, even those clauses, they do very little to address these kind of issues that, for example, uh, the sister was talking about, the spatial construction of South Africa. So much that artists, writers, they have to always work with what is in place before they can bring their own ideas. And this is always my challenge. Before I write about my own thought, I have to clean the, the space because there's this white lingering so-called discourses, architecture, right? So I cannot come and write about my experience without saying, for example, who have written about what it means to live in a township. So in other words, whatever we have to deal with, there's already a setup context for us, that we have to wrestle with that. That's why I call it, there's a, a kind, of, kind of cleaning up before we talk about ourselves. So the black writer also entered that, but you correct me if I'm getting it wrong, all right? There's that. Another point, you know, I, mean, I would like you to talk about is this notion of, because earlier when you started, you talk about what it is you're writing about and the ways in which, so I'm, I'm detecting two things there. There's content. When you say, this is what I have to write about, what it is that black writers have to write about? Two, the ways in which black writers must write. So I'm asking them, what is this content that black writers must deal with or articulate? And two, in what ways that black writers must write? It means that are there forms, are there new strategies, are there uh, particular sensibilities or ways in which you have to write differently? Again, the burden of being black never free us to just do what we want. We have to always deal with these presets. Am I making sense? Yes. Those three points. OK. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, actually, I like the, the notion you bring up of, of biograph. Now, uh, especially with, the, with the black people in general, uh, when you go to, to apply for a job, there's always uh, 
the sense of like you you take your your, your narrative from the township with you. Uh, now what what I mean about now with, uh, the historical location is that the institution itself or the magazine or the publishing company they don't have that burden of articulating the narrative where they come from, for example, and also like also your point you made about that apartheid had a, a narrative or a story before it, it officially began. They don't even have that burden of articulating uh, like, a, like the story of transformation, uh, yes, post-apartheid, but also in terms of how, how inclusion is not just about uh, like, a, like a economics, but it's also about knowledge production, uh, it's also about acknowledging the diversity that actually makes up the spectrum of South Africa. Uh, also, uh, the point about methods or ways of writing or what the, the writer has to write about. Uh, that, for me, deals with, uh, with also like the psyche of black people in general. In a way, the writer is uh, a vehicle for articulating the psyche. And for me, I think that, that burden or that responsibility is uh, to articulate this dualism of coming from a, a poor background or uh, and, and being influenced and actually having to develop a kind of a second psyche, you know, or from uh, like about a uh, from like a high art perspective. Uh, so there are ways where you have to write about where you, by actually writing, you're already implicating yourself in the narrative. You're, you're, you're breaking down already the world. Now in terms of uh, aspiring and uh, sort of like reaching the goals of, uh, of articulating also the high art that, uh, that, that, that defines in a way practice, uh, you you kind of have to like es like eschew them or, or disregard them and have a like have an emotional and also like a, like inter intellectual reaction more uh, more than a historic because the historic reaction will actually uh, will no, will not make you will not give you the option of engaging like the value of contemporary aesthetics and that's the, like yeah, that's my my approach of, of of writing about art, like trying to articulate an extent a contemporary aesthetic, because already already by writing, I'm already implicating my narrative or my community's narrative, uh, and it's a and it becomes a matter of of of, of access or or lack of access already there in my writing. There was another point you made, uh, a second point you made. Uh, okay, please remind me. That, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll come. We'll come. We'll come back to some. Because I'm sure the floor will remind us. One of the things, I'm, as I'm listening to, my interest is: is there a particular subject, or are there different subjects that like should articulate than other writers? That's one thing I'd like you to to help me think about. If you are writing as a black writer, not as a writer. Two, and, 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 and you, you spoke about, you used the word symbolic transformation. And, and I'm curious, because yes, we have notions such as rainbow, you know, which is a symbolic of, of diversity. And yet on the ground, at the level of what you call it materiality, the rainbow doesn't hold, there's a joke that even there's no black color in that rainbow. So then, I would like you to talk, you know, I mean, on this notion of the symbolic transformation. What you mean by that? And you use a word which I enjoy: ethics of transformation. So, I'd like you to help us as a thinker that writes, what it is you mean by this notion of symbolic transformation to ethic, uh, ethic transformation. Okay, but the notion symbolic transformation is a uh, it's there's in a way when your work is accepted in publication, there's there's 
an insidious element that actually you can detect that it's uh, it's it's about it's not about acknowledging the historic location you know it's about uh, just uh, a kind of talking I hate the term but it's it's really yeah, yeah that's basically the, the fundamentals of that and this again it comes back to the responsibility of the institution the is or the magazine or the publisher they also have this uh, this responsibility of of articulating or expressing how they are inclusive of different voices uh, or, or or alternative voices because I think when you also speak about how like uh, like the black writer and way in terms of creating how uh, creating new ways of writing. Uh, the institution does not, uh, yeah, they, they don't keep up with that, and it's almost like they don't have the, 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 the historic burden, you know, that's, that's what's urgent for me, like, how come the institution does not have that burden, you know, because at the end of the day, it's a knowledge production institution, and it's, and for me, fundamentally, coming from a, a poor background, it's, uh, it's an issue of, of, yeah, the institution, the publisher, is also like a, a, a communal, uh, like it, it has a communal responsibility. Like that's that's one of also one of the things I mean about the historic position or the historic location. Uh, and also this this the issue of ethics of of transformation. Uh, how there's obviously with cultural production there's a uh, we. We hi we hold highly uh, like uh, strategies of creativity, and this is has to do with how you attract writers, how you attract business, and uh, also the content you produce. Uh, so there's a, also the institution has that responsibility of devising new ways of, of like of expressing itself. You know, it, it's also an entity. Uh, that's yeah, kind of the kind of position I think I'm meeting or trying to realize with my blog. Okay, two things and then we'll open it to the floor. You know, earlier you, you, you also mentioned the, the question of the voice. You know, and you said black writers do have the voice, right? But that voice is circumscribed by the condition under which or through which the black writers are working. As you were saying, for example, with the line, if I, I can rephrase it uh, correctly, they must knock at the door and wait. You are for them, you know. And so that's and that notion of waiting. I'm interested. What's happening during that moment of waiting? Who's waiting for? Me? That's one in terms of the black writer and her voice or his voice. The other point, as I'm interested, you keep on talking about institutions, and this is something I've been dealing with for a while that. We have a tendency to speak of institutions as buildings or structures. And then we always examine people who run these institutions, people who produce systems, people who maintain systems, people who renovate systems. So when we speak, for example, of, let's say, vets, or we speak of, let's say, museum, we always speak of it as if it's humanless. Mm -hmm. And yet, people make those decisions. People are gatekeepers. People are frustrators of other people. So I would like us to think of institution in terms of human economies so that we can begin to point exactly who are these institutions, who are maintaining these institutions, who are maintaining was In that way, we won't make institutions an abstract problem. We'll begin to say there are figures that are responsible. And then once we begin to identify them, we can not only expose them, we can also demonstrate how they are frustrating or they are creating what you call it inclusion or exclusion. They are producing the binaries. Can we begin to move maybe away from this abstract notion of institution as the building or as a system that is not even articulated in most cases to humans because people run institutions. People make decisions in institutions. Same thing that applies also to writers because writers are institutions because it is their work through words, right? that we are able to either learn or to, 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 to reflect on certain things. You know I mean? So I'd like you to talk on those two things. Let me just summarize quickly the question of the voice, 
what it means to have a voice. Again, I did different grammars, I did different registers. You know, you mentioned like some of the writers, Ken Temba and all of that. You know, that drama magazine, but within the visual sphere, who are the writers today? What kind of issues are they dealing with? In what ways are they writing? Is it different or are they just, you know, part of what is already in place? Or are they bringing new things that we have to look at? Or are they asking us different questions? Are they opening up different avenues of imagining other worlds other than that we know? You know? And then last, as I said, again, I would like you to comment what it means to be a writer in light of this notion of institution. Then after that, we'll open to questions. Okay, I, I like this question. Because in a way, it gets me thinking about, again, like the, the social commentator or the art critic as a social commentator. Uh, for me, the, so, the art critic as a social commentator is, is the image of, I don't know, the privileged white woman who has emotional reactions to art that uh, are basically like, grounded on negative criticism. And for me, that's like kind of attitude that perpetuates that what's ideological, you know, about uh, about institutions <coughs> and their relationship to right. Uh, hence, again, I say that institutions, like with your point, that they have faith, they they, are, they have people resources, like their resource is people, like individuals who are created. Uh, uh, for me, again, it's, it's again it's their responsibility to to devise and formulate new ways of, uh, of, of attracting writers and communicating with writers. And uh, with, with your point of, of how other writers are approaching uh, like contemporary writing, for me I feel they, they, it's, it's this, again, I, ideological scheming uh, of, of, of perpetuating uh, that devolution of power from the top of the institution to the bottom, where at the bottom there seems to be no voice if it doesn't uh, reflect what's happening supposedly at the top of the institution. You know, so we kind of st stuck in that historic panel. Now again, it becomes difficult for me to evaluate my work if it's really authentic in the sense that uh, it breaks down those, those barriers. Uh, because I get very little, little reaction from like, uh, uh, publications and publishers. But I, I know the only way I know the value of my work is, that, is, uh, is, through, how, is through where I come from and uh, how I express myself and, uh, and, and what art means to me, actually. Yeah. What art means to me and how in, in a diverse community like South Africa, uh, I, I can't just have a limited perspective where uh, I write just about township artists because again, it's that perpetuates that, that ideological scheme, you know, become, in that, become trapped in that same paradigm of like uh, low arts and high arts. Uh, yeah, how, how, how do we break that down through the writing itself, you know, through, yeah, through our actual presence, you know, it be becoming more than symbolic, but they are actually become, becoming about actual transformation.